Good afternoon. I'm Danielle Knapp, the Makash Curator at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Visiting Artists Lecture Series program presented by the Department of Art and the Center for Art Research and co-sponsored by JSMA, featuring Los Angeles-based artist Leslie Saar. The University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilihi, the traditional indigenous homelands of the Kalipu Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon and to all displaced indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. Today's talk by Leslie Saar is titled Surrealism, Symbolism and Significance. Leslie makes paintings, drawings, altered books, banners, collages, dioramas and installations. And often working in series, she addresses notions of race, gender, beauty, normalcy, escapism and sanity. Leslie has exhibited nationally and internationally and is represented in many museum collections, including the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art uh, her mixed media banner titled Miss Pearlie, the Transcontinental Mind Reader, was featured in our museum's 2021 exhibition, Look, Listen, Learn, Act, a common seeing response to the university's common reading focus on listening to and learning from Black experience and Blackness in America and the commitment to dismantling racism. I will share a link to that virtual tour um, during Leslie's talk at one point. And I also want to share that she has a solo show at the Craft Contemporary in LA coming up this fall. Um, we invite you to ask any questions in the Q&A box during her talk, and we'll see how many we can get through towards the end of our hour together. I wanna to thank Wendy Heldman and Melody Moore for assisting us with our program today. And um, it, now we're happy to turn over to Leslie to share about her work. And thanks so much for being with us today. Hi, everybody. Let me get my thing up here. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Leslie, Leslie Saar. I live down here in Los Angeles. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to come up to the school to do a talk and studio visits, but I'm really thrilled to be doing it via Zoom. So let's leap into my little slide presentation. You know, I started doing books when I was living in the Bay Area, San Francisco and Berkeley. I often did illustrations for my writer friends. And then that evolved into doing my own books with silly little stories until finally I just said, we'll do the books with the images. So I started doing the, I call them altered books where I'll take a book and I'll collage some sort of cover on it, scoop it out, insert a painting within it and then glass it in. And um, I started mainly doing these in the early nineties. So this one here, it's called Humio and Iola. And it's from a bit later, it's from the year 2000, but it's from my anomaly series where I've sort of um, investigated and questioned the notion of normalcy with regards to beauty, um, mental capacity, you know, neurological, uh, race, gender, sexuality, just questioning all these ideas of norm and what is and isn't beautiful. And often I did portraits of people who were in um, sideshows. So these were two actual brother and sister, Humio and Iola, who um, had very small heads. The derogatory term would have been pinhead, I suppose. But the thing I liked about doing these altered books was sort of it being a metaphor for um, uh, telling a story, escapism, being sucked into some type of narrative just by the essence of it being all encased within a book to the next series. So I'm sort of doing these chronologically. <laughs> this one here is titled Religious Melancholia and it's from the year 2012. And this is from my Mad Woman in the Attic series and Madness in the Gaze it was a two part series. But it was basically where I was examining um, you know, insane female heroines from 19th century literature. You know, that's a mouthful, but um, it was very interesting to me how the heroines in most of these novels from the 19th century were either victims or these sort of um, fine upstanding people, but the ones who kind of went insane actually gained agency, you know, they got, they escaped their victimization 
relaxation and vulnerability. And so certain characters such as Bertha from Jane Eyre or Zola's Therese Racan, um, I found really quite exceptional in how they had gained agency through their insanity. And then I also was examining, um, you know, treatments and cures for mental illness in that period and how so much of it was termed um, female hysteria and how many of uh, their rights were taken away and such. So I did these large paintings. They're on masonite. I covered them with fabric and the, um, the medium is acrylic. And then I've taken photos of still lives. In some cases, I did these kind of tiny um, miniature dioramas to kind of fill out the, um, the symbolism, the uh, stories behind it. Um, so this one is called, <clears throat> yeah, this one was from, uh, did I say from 2012 and it's Religious Melancholia. Next we're on my Monad series where um, I'm very interested in the occult and, and um, you know, mysticism and, and met metaphysics and all of that kind of knowledge, you know, from um, Tibet that was brought to the United States, uh, to the West from women like um, Madame Blavatsky and Alice Bailey and Annie Besant. It's interesting that it was mostly women that brought these Eastern uh, Tibetan teachings to the West. And so I'm like, okay, I'm very interested in this. I belong to this group and everything. How can I do a series on it? So I called the series Monad, which actually is a spark, an essence. And it relates to the, the, um, to the saying, as above, so below. So I was hatching on to that, latching on to that, <laughs> that idea of like from the tiniest minutest cell on your, you know, within a human body to the human body, to a family, society, to earth, to the, um, you know, to, 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 to the solar system, to the galaxy, to the universe, all of that sort of thing. It's a paradigm of a living organism that works uh, in a similar way that's codependent and works that way. And so the notion of as, as above, not meaning God necessarily, but the celestial universe, so below down to the more minutest cell. So at that length of the <laughs> explanation. Oh, and that one is called Celestial Bridge. So, um, so what I did was I, did uh, renderings of human cells or biological type renderings and I flipped the scale so they're the size of a planet or some large star and I have people hurtling through space um, so I've just kind of flipped, flipped the scale I've used a more um, kind of bright futuristic uh, palette than I usually use yet the people are housed in um, they're they're dressed in 19th century Victorian clothing. So there's this tension between future and the past, a juxtaposition of um, flipping the scale, something that's, that's almost invisible to being larger than, um, you know, the other items in the, in the, in the, in the photograph, in the painting. And um, just sort of playing with this idea of, um, you know, uh, I guess all of them are kind of questioning, like sort of um, realities and, and notions and and science and all of that kind of thing. But um, yeah, and this one is called cell realization. So I like to set things in this Victorian era. I like the period, I like the Gothic period. And also it's a way to kind of honor uh, my ancestors and to, to deal with certain subjects um, at a little bit of a distance to get a little bit of a, um, a narrative, a little fiction to it, a little bit of a distance as opposed to like, if I were to approach this topic of Monad, well, how would I do that in, in the present? It would feel rather new agey and just something I would be uncomfortable with. So I like that kind of distance of, of setting things in, in the past and, um, and yeah, just kind of having that entertainment there. <laughs> um, all right, now this is the piece that is that is that you all have up there <laughs> that she had mentioned it's um this is uh, miss pearly the transcontinental mind reader and it's a large banner the other pieces i should have said are smaller they're maybe like 20 inches maximum they're they're smaller you know um but the banners are quite large this one is 85 inches by 45 inches and i've sewn the banner um with fabric and using various antique trims and um, 
um, tassels and, and bits of embroidery and sewn on. But everything inside is painted. I painted the lace and her face. And so this is from my gender renaissance series, which was um, where I examined the notion of gender. And it all relates to my having a trans son who, um, let's see, started transitioning right after high school. So it was uh, the whole journey of helping him uh, transition and questioning this whole notion of, of gender. So that's what sort of sparked that idea. I always kind of deal with ideas from a personal, um, something that's going on personally in my life. I just sort of feel like it has to be important enough for me to put all this time into it. So usually it's something either that I'm studying or, or reading or something that I can relate to that's going on in my life. So this one is also from the uh, Gender Renaissance series. It's a smaller piece. It is called, it's my nature. And it's like 21 inches by 15. Um, I always use acrylic, it's acrylic, painted on fabric. I don't like to ever paint just on a white canvas or a whiteboard. I like to start with some sort of um, something that's bringing some history to it. I used to do paintings on old record covers or book covers or, uh, other existing things just to sort of start with, just to already have there be some sort of history or some sort of um, layer. I like working in layers. So um, using the symbolism of a different <clears throat> iconic gender types of things. So this is a trans woman, but I've thrown in notions of um, what is and isn't masculine or feminine, such as a pipe. But then there's images of nature like a shell or this beetle or this microscopic strange looking hat over um, whatever a cool ball is <laughs> and the brain. And so kind of my idea with this series and juxtaposing all of this um, imagery, all of these different symbols and, and imagery in a sort of surrealistic manner was to get to the notion of, well, um, what is real? What is true? Like, I feel always when I have images of nature, like that's just truth, right? Because nature is, there's not anything cultural or anything that's uh, environmentally learned or passed on through society. There's kind of a truth there. So when I throw that in, some image from nature is kind of saying, okay, what is truth? That's kind of saying, okay, this is this person's truth. <clears throat> so um, this also is from the, gender renaissance series and this one is called it's called the silent woman so i did this one back in 2015 and um again i'm just sort of questioning i mean within the the whole gender um question <laughs> there's just all of these different personal types of uh of levels and, and questioning of what is masculine and what is feminine and um, is either someone either trans male or trans female, are they non-binary or gender non-conforming? And so um, I did a lot of research and this was actually a play that was called The Silent Woman that was written a long, long time ago. So um, kind of my idea also for this theme of setting it in the past is to say, well, this might be some current issue now within society, the whole trans um, movement and social issues, but it didn't just start now, it's been going on for centuries, you know, because this is just how people have always been, you know, wanting to express their true self. So again, I've got the scale a bit reversed, the, um, the hourglass is larger than the little warthog or pig, whatever that is, little wild pig and, um, so just sort of like shaking things up a bit with, with scale and putting things off at different angles and um, yet trying to have there be a stillness and all of them I sort of have this stillness or maybe a melancholy um, juxtaposed with things being askewed and kind of um, Luther say kind of turned upside down. This one is called Forbidden Fruit. I hope we're seeing the full screen. And it is also from the uh, Gender Renaissance series. And of course, I'm sort of referencing back to the biblical uh, 
notion of Adam and Eve and the garden, the whole beginning of male, female, and just kind of questioning it in that way, but giving it a bit of a futuristic thing with this, instead of an apple, there's a green glowing orb in the mouth of the snake. And um, I very much love Gothic. It just makes me feel good. <laughs> so I'll throw in this sort of Gothic thing and be like, oh, what does that have to do with trans issues? But it's just adding another layer to it, just kind of uh, in my own personal way, suggesting the, com the complexity of it all and the multi layeredness of it all. And, um, you know, just uh, <clears throat> giving it that added, um, that added way of maybe escapism or, or being able to be transported out of our everyday um, thing, you know. I mean, I think it's very interesting. I do, I do agree, I think it was Nina Simone that said that art should be um, reflective of the, of the present and dealing with the present. And yeah, I agree with that. So I'll try to usually find topics or themes that are present and important and are going on with me in the present or in society or what have you. But I also feel escapism is important and entertainment and being transported. So I'll set it in the past. That's another reason I like to set it in the past. Okay, now we're moving to a more recent series. This is from my A Conjuring of Conjurers series. And I have these two totems, these, these conjurers surrounding a large banner. So I wrote stories for, <laughs> for all of them. The one in the middle, the large banner, this is Septim, a collector of breezes, hoarder of voices and gatherer of olfactory ephemera. Once changed her lover into a lake to protect him. And the one on the, the, the right with peacocks, that's Pione, master of the direction of space and time, got blood out of a turnip from a stone when he stepped on tomorrow. And then the totem, the conjurer on the left, that's Fern Nest, is the raggedy guardian of the shrines. Hidden deep in the forest were large clay pots filled with hair and nail clippings collect rainwater and leaves. So my, for this conjuring of conjurers, this uh, seems maybe a little bit um, remote, but Conjuring of Conjurers, it was inspired by Against Nature or Our Boars, which was a 19th century novel written by Joris Karl Usman. And in this book, the protagonist, he isolates himself from society. He withdraws from society and he built his own private realm of the census fortress where he searches within himself, I think, to find his truth, to find what he truly believes is beautiful or excellent in the fields of art, literature, botany, um, perfume, liqueurs, music, etc. So he basically conjures up his own really magnificent reality by creating rooms dedicated to each of these topics or subjects. So I read that book and it was just wild, really funny and just total examine. I took all these notes. It was just total examination of all these different things. And it was before um, Proust, I believe. So it was really very interesting and not in a traditional plot sense, um, but just really delving deep into different subjects and, and, um, and having their, their own observations. So I latched onto this idea of conjuring, like conjuring your own reality. Like he conjured his own house, exploring all these different topics. And it's like, okay, I like this idea, but how am I going to do it? That's always like the beginning of these things. Is, um, and often the result is not like, what? This has nothing to do with the book, but that's how it started. <laughs> I like to say how these things started. So I thought I would do this idea of portraying conjurers of every sort who create different realities by telling tales and casting spells and performing illusions, sprinkling goofer desks on doorsteps, that kind of thing. So every portrait, banner, totem, collage in the show is a conjurer and I wrote stories for all of them. So I use elements of um, like surrealism and symbolism and the occult to sort of stir things up a bit and to ask questions dealing with, um, you know, even within this topic of conjuring, I'm still asking questions dealing with notions of race and gender and and always with a rather kind of 19th century 
Gothic slant. So you can see in this portrait, um, the woman has blue eyes. So in many of my portraits, I'm questioning the notion of race. I myself being someone who's very lightly melanated and one could say passing, white passing, or of course not intentionally, I've always, you know, my whole life wanting to look more like my mother. Um, I don't know if it was introduced in the beginning, but my mother is Betty Saar, the well-known black um, assemblage artist. So um, that's just been a whole thing my whole life, like looking different than who I am. <laughs> and so always questioning, okay, is race how you are inside, how you feel inside, or is it how you are perceived by others? And of course it's both. And certainly during, you know, these times with Black Lives Matter and everything, I would never pretend to, um, I would never do that type of subject because I'm not affected in that way. I'm, like, I'm never gonna like be killed by a cop, you know, because of how I look. So I always try to acknowledge my, my privilege and be very careful about taking up space, um, not only when I'm in exhibitions or doing talks, but even within the subjects that I deal with, be very careful that the subjects I feel are um, authentic to my experience. <laughs> so this is also from Conjuring of Conjurer series. It's a small, really detailed painting. And this is a sound and He's kind of the main character in that book uh, against nature. So Asant did not like reality. So he built his own dream of the census fortress, which ultimately was a disappointment. And this explains his, his love of tragedy. So this piece is from 2018. And again, I'm dealing with notions of nature, um, what is true or isn't true and um, again, kind of dealing with symbols of masculine and femininity, and again, dealing with notions of race, with a dark-skinned person with light blue eyes. I always throw in those questionings regardless of what the theme is. <laughs> but this one is pretty much illustrating kind of a scene from that book. This one is Zerpanta uh, Banner. Zerpanta, born under the shade of a black willow tree in New Orleans, in 1826, sits on a rock turning rain into tobacco smoke. So this is a banner, it's from my Conjuring of Conjuring series, the same series, it's like 69 inches by 53. And um, yeah, so this is kind of hearkening to a hoodoo, voodoo. My grandfather is from Lake Charles, Louisiana. I've always been interested in like Marie Laveau and the whole history from coming out of New Orleans. And when I visited there, it always felt so much like home. And so um, this is this piece here, there. And I also did collages for this series, The Conjuring of Conjurers. And this one is called, I Turn My Back on the Ocean, Defacing the Ocean. And um, yeah, it's very gothic, very moody, very melancholy. <laughs> I just, I don't know, I just dig that mood. This is also from the Conjuring of Conjurer series. And this is Yasa, a trickster who lives in every corner of the forest. Sometimes she appears as a goat with a woman's head, passing in and out of the visible world, partaking in ridiculous orgies. Did this one in 2019. I like finding these old frames like at the swap meets or flea markets. And um, again, this is notion of using something that, that's, that's found, adding history to it. Um, I'm really fond of kitsch stuff, you know, like not, for me, if I throw something in there that's kitsch, it's like, okay, I'm not taking myself too seriously. We can see a little bit of humor in it. Um, and then just all the juxtapositions of everything in this one with the snake and the bat, and you've got the egg. Uh, it's just like a whole lot of magic going on, conjuring going on. Here's another banner from um, my Conjuring of Conjurers series where I wanted to sort of play with the idea of uh, negative. And, um, you know, often I would think of, oh, well, what's a, a negative, like with regard to a photograph? And I've always thought, well, that's just sort of the opposite. But if you take an image of a black person and make it a negative, 
it's not quite the opposite, you know, it's still going to be, it, it's just kind of interesting to sort of, um, and it was a challenge for me to try to paint something in a negative. I have this program that can like, I don't know, to, to, to fool around with how things look like in negatives. So, okay, so her story there is, this is Nasita, was a hit or miss mind reader. Sometimes tears trickle from her ears when she is overwhelmed by the inner feelings of others. That's, all right, got one more from the Conjuring series. Um, here we have another conjurer or totem, and these are quite tall. They're, you know, like six, eight, they're, they're quite tall, almost seven feet tall. So um, this is Olfida, the abandoned bride, finds books in broken branches, sermons in stones, rituals in roots, and sagas in silent seas. So this was from 2019. And <clears throat> I just really had fun dealing with the monochromatic kind of thing here and off white and you know, taking old photo of some, I think it's actually from her communion, not a bride, but um, whatever. <laughs> and um, just sort of hanging different objects uh, from her coral and bones and um, old columns, that kind of thing, cotton. Uh, I would take fiber fill and dye it. So, the head feels like either puffs of smoke or, or wild hair coming out of out of her neck, and um, yeah, they all kind of have their little stories about their certain powers and 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 their abilities or their sort of tricks that they could do. So that was a lot of fun coming up with with stories and and I just like working in different medium to kind of get the whole idea of a concept across. Like if I'm going to do a conjuring of conjurers. There's going to be paintings, banners, collages, and these large totems to put everything together and help it word them bounce off of each other and tell a bit more of a story. I like to think about that when I'm doing an exhibition. And this show was at Walter Maciel Gallery, um, 2020, beginning of 2020. Uh, so that was fairly recently, like it was January 2020. Oh yeah, I have these things on the floor, bones and coral and shells. And all that kind of stuff. Oh, and I had this bulb on here and it like started blooming like it was a lily or something. And during the two months of the show, like the stem was coming out. So that was kind of magical. Okay, now we're going to my most recent series, which was called Black Garden. And um, this is where I took a poem by Antonin Artaud, who was a playwright. He wrote essays, he wrote poetry in his early years. Uh, this French guy in the early um, 1900s. And um, I really like this poem of his called Black Garden. And um, let me see, I don't have the poem in front of me. Let me see if I can remember the poem. The poem goes, they have blossomed from the lands of death, these flowers which a long wrought dream has poured with ashes and the unearthly vapor of a bed of night iris shedding petals one by one like the hours of darkness. Through the tidal wave of a terrible season into the black waters, the slow diamonds of the luminous hour glittered strange. Illumination of a glitter of a capsized sun. The lilies have squandered the whole dark hoard of the lovely garden pounded by the sea. And the hardened metal of your sacred temples has crumbled. O oh, stems, behold the night offering, the keys that open wide her gates of horns, emanations of delivered souls. So that's the poem that I kind of messed up, but um, all right. So this, so for each painting, I took like a line from the poem and I'm like, how do I translate this line into an image? So this one was uh, the lilies have squandered the whole dark hoard of the lovely garden pounded by the sea. And um, this in this found this kind of kitsch, baroque, whatever, rococo, gaudy <laughs> frame. <laughs> um, uh, a found frame uh, and the, um, you know, painted on fabric and acrylic. And I wanted to have these images in their mind of, um, by putting it in black and white, it being like it was a memory or, or uh, a, a movie or some sort of projected fantasy, some other reality than the actual uh, person, even though they have all that other paraphernalia on them, but it's kind of challenging the reality of what's within their mind and then the actual person. And so uh, in this series, I used a lot of flora and fauna, lots of flowers and 
and moss and bark and coral and that kind of thing because um, well, the poem is basically about nature. This is a banner that's from the Black Garden series and uh, it's the illumination of a capsized sun. It's like 81 inches by 45 inches. So there's, there's a tension and scale from the small paintings to these large banners again. And often like the piece that, um, that you know, the university has, I'll do portraits of people with albinism and I, We'll use that as a metaphor for myself, uh, a person of black heritage who appears white. So it's this notion of um, a black person with albinism. I will use that often as a, uh, in my portraits. And, and the mixed media here, I played around more with putting fabrics on her actual uh, dress and body. And um, I find old embroidery like the ship. I'll, I'll just really have a lot of fun sewing the banners together. And, these brass turtles and a cameo and bits of hair, you know, um, like to throw in real hair or doll's hair or whatever that is. Um, this one is called Of the Luminous Hour Glittered Strange and it's from a Black, the Black Garden series. And um, I am very influenced by the Costa paintings of say Mexico and Latin America or the islands that are from the 1700s where the Spaniards like really did a number on putting together all the combinations of, 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 of people within their races and what sort of child they produced. And um, so I found that just so interesting sociologically and the style of painting I liked, I felt it fixed with my mixed heritage of um, you have this European influence on, on a country like Mexico or the Philippines and how does that actually end up, up looking, you know, end up looking. It's, um, it's the style of painting that I've latched onto if you're gonna call it anything. I mean, within the surrealism and the symbolism, I titled the, the talk that way because um, often I'm dealing with themes and that kind of thing. And I thought, well, let's just sort of talk about what I'm doing uh, physically. Like, how would you describe the paintings no matter what theme it is? And so you've got the theme, the symbolism of nature here and, and the hourglass and, and this sort of warrior thing going on with, with the weapons. And it just sort of um, incoherently all kind of forms together to, to, to make a message which isn't totally spelled out, which I like. So you can kind of take away from it, which you like. Um, but yeah, definitely I would say that's sort of the style of painting that I kind of latched onto is that colonial style of painting from the 1700s. Uh, this one is called, um, and the hardened metal of your sacred columns has trembled. And um, it's from the Black Garden series. So this one was a bit challenging. I'm like, wow, how do I, well, illustrate isn't the right word because I didn't want to illustrate it, but I wanted it to make sense. Like if I took a stanza from the poem and, um, I don't know, I just sort of came up with this without breaking it down too much. One of the things that Antonin Artaud said was like um, this whole notion of art being magic. And if you uh, try to pin it down too much or talk about too much, it's like you're murdering it. And so he has a book like called uh, How to Murder Magic or something like that. So I don't want to murder magic by explaining it too much. Um, hopefully I haven't done that already, but uh, that was sort of the challenge to me. It wasn't about an issue or anything like that, this Black Garden series. It was more ephemeral, ethereal, and kind of taking poetry and um, a challenge for myself as to how to translate that into painting. This banner is also from the Black Garden series and it's titled Through the Tidal Wave of the Terrible Season. And um, yeah, it's a large banner. It's like 78 inches by, by 51. And I started doing banners maybe 20 years ago. So this is something I've been doing for, for quite a while. I, I had a series called um, Mulatto Nation where I did banners of all the founding mothers and fathers of the Mulatto Nation. So I've continued to do that and I'm still working on some of those now. And, um, you know, just going for a Gothic melancholy um, kind of mood. <laughs> What else is new? Let me check the time. Um, maybe I'm going too quickly here. Um, yeah. Okay, so now I'll come to what I'm working on now. I've decided like after 20 years or so to go back to making the 
altered books. So this is a new one that I'm working on now. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure of the theme. Sometimes this is sort of how I'll, I'll start. I'll have an idea in my mind and maybe the imagery doesn't really quite work. I'm, it's probably not obvious at all, but I'm interested in, in addressing colorism, you know, and um, just trying to help get some sort of awareness uh, out there and um, be very careful about how I present myself and that kind of thing. And still sort of, it's a way for me to continue this sort of uh, questioning and observations of notion of race, but maybe with sort of a different, uh, slightly different approach. So this is a book where once again, I've scooped everything out. Um, I found these old photographs that where I've juxtaposed images of architecture and nature. And it's kind of like this whole questioning of um, nature versus nurture or your nature versus environment or what's natural versus what's man-made or societal images. I'll often do that in collages and painting, kind of the juxtaposition of, um, you know, of those two items, uh, those two things. Um, there, that, that's the very last one. So yeah, just um, kind of in summarizing, um, you know, the title of the show, of my little talk here, being surrealism, symbolism, and significance. Um, I always like to start with the theme, pick a theme that's significant to me, has meaning to me, based on my experience or what I'm really interested in at the moment and approaching it physically, like how does it actually end up looking through the lens of surrealism and symbolism and then just it being basically mixed media for me to uh, really try to get an idea across of combining of the, of the medias. So um, I think if I've left out anything else, but um, Basically, that's it. So I'm going to stop the share. There we go. <laughs> Thank you so much. So wonderful to see images from the past several years of what you've been exploring in your work and to see the new work. And um, there was a question that you, you actually started to answer after this um, audience member asked this, but maybe you can expand a little more on this. Um, saying thank you for sharing about you know, where you get your old frames and find materials. Um, and so for making the banners for that process, you mentioned that you hand make those. Are you hand sewing those? Are you using only old like found materials? Or are you mixing new materials with old materials? Can you just talk a little bit more about the process yeah. of what how the banners come together for you? Right, yeah, that's actually a good question. Um, sometimes I'll find old materials like online, I'll find some old brocade or it's gotta be pretty large to begin with. But then you, usually I'm at like Joanne's with all the other house frows buying <laughs> fabric. <laughs> for my project. Um, so yeah, I'll start with something like that, that may have, um, you know, a toile or some sort of print on it that, that's nostalgic, you know, but it's basically new, new fabric because it needs to be like 45 or 56 inches wide and, and quite long. So, but then to kind of give it, uh, so it doesn't feel brand new because I like things to feel like they've got some history or lived in kind of thing. I'll, uh, I'll, treat it, you know, I'll, I'll do some sort of um, wash on it to, to, to give some color to it. And then I often use antique trims and just various strange things that I find in the way of embroideries or uh, tassels or bits of beaded from costumes or, or... so by adding that, if, if anyone is interesting and interested in getting something across that feels like it's ancient, you can, you can work with new materials, you just sort of need to to treat them. And that's actually something I learned from my mother who was very, very good at um, unifying like uh, old and new objects. Usually she finds a lot of truly old things, but um, yeah, that was something that I really picked up from her. And of course, kind of this whole notion of mixed media and found objects. My sister, Allison, who's a sculptor, we both did. That's just kind of our family thing, you know? <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's a mixture of, of old and new. And I love that. And idea. I do sew them myself. I actually, everybody's saying, oh, you got to like shop these things out. And it just wasn't a great experience. It was a terrible job and broke my sewing machine. And so I, I do all the work myself. <laughs> I'm the only idiot who does everything herself, but I enjoy it. I like working alone. I don't have any assistance. I mean, I have my son, my, um, my son lives at home with me. So he helps me with stuff that I don't, yeah. 
I don't have any assistance. I sew it myself. <laughs> that mix of old and new too, and kind of um, sort of creating something out of this melding of materials and ideas and references. It, it totally speaks to that escapism to me that you were describing about oh, that right. fiction uh -huh. or that element of fantasy in the work. And um, so I find that really special. And having seen your work at our museum in person too, looking closely at it, and, and for anyone who had the opportunity to look at it in the gallery last year, it would be, for me, it would be impossible to tell too that those were any new materials because of mm -hmm. uh, how you've, you've uh, reinvented them. Um, mm -hmm. I also wondered too, because so many of the images you showed, showed animals. And mm -hmm. we've been talking a lot about animals and humans relations and sort of the human world and the more than human world, um, which relates to this year's common reading of Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. So we've been thinking about, you know, human and animal interactions um, on mm -hmm. campus and especially at the museum. And, um, you know, some of the animals you showed like snakes have universal significance, exactly, you know, symbolism yeah. around mm -hmm. the world. And I mean, certainly others, bats and other animals you show um, mm -hmm. have great significance. Are you choosing animals for reasons based on research? Cause I know you heavily research elements of these or is it more of sort of an emotional or sort of other factors and why you choose what you do? In some of those cases? Uh, yeah, well, often it would have to do with what the theme is, like the gender renaissance one, say the woman who's holding the, the snake with the orb, and um, because I, the, it's called Forbidden Fruit, and it kind of clearly reference to the whole Garden of Eden thing, and um, and yeah, snakes, they, they represent fertility, they represent change, they represent uh, lots of things, I guess because they shed their skin, they're symbolic of change, and uh, or rebirth, or that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, the, and I like it when they'll have multiple interpretations. So the person viewing it is not just gonna see it one way, you know? Um, so it's a combination of, okay, the symbolism of it. And then it really fits with um, um, just kind of my interest in, in hoodoo and voodoo, even though that series was gender renaissance, I just sort of like the, the kind of magical, mysterious element of that, you know? And kind of the danger, I'm not gonna do like a, cute little kitten you know it's going to be a, a bat or something kind of, uh you know weird the, the tortoise I just really got into I think maybe for a visual thing it's actually a part uh, of this story that I based a conjuring of conjurers where uh this guy he set up a room and he bought a rug but it was too gaudy it was too bright so he bought a tor tortoise to walk around on the rug to tone down the room but it just made the rug seem brighter because the tortoise was just a dull. <laughs> so he bejeweled this tortoise. He inlaid all these jewels all over the tortoise and then the tortoise died. So that's a big major part of this novel that I sort of based this conjuring of conjurers on. So um, that had a significance, a symbolism relating to the novel, but then it was just really fun to paint. It's very detailed. And um, so sometimes it is a combination of the visual, like, that's sort of the most important thing is for me beyond the symbolism and it kind of helps it for me to not be too obvious is it has to kind of look good <laughs> for lack of a better word um instead of just like oh I want to say this and I'm going to use all these symbols um it's got to have a certain mood uh so all of those things go into into play when choosing an animal and not too cute and that book, um, was it Against Nature? Was that the book that you said? Mm -hmm. Someone asked for clarification on that. The book yes. that was the um, inspiration for Conjuring of Conjurers. Yeah, the author's name is Usman, H-U-I-S-M-A-N-S. -S. I think there's an S at the end. Another audience question was, um, thanks for the fascinating talk and would love to know more about the surrealist influence on your work and its resonance today. Oh, that's a good question. I love the early women surrealists that all ended up in Mexico, like uh, Remedio Spara and Leonora Carrington, uh, um, Frida Kahlo. Um, what's the recent one? I just got a book of uh, Dorothea Tanning. I just got a great book of hers that was recently released. And um, yeah, and how they were very, very um, interested in the occult and mysticism, and they put a lot of those kinds of elements into their paintings. And, um, you know, of course, I try to do my own thing and hope it looks like my own thing, but I love starting my morning, like with my coffee and looking through art books like that, like, uh, 
Well, Leonora Carrington, she's just amazing. You know, I, <laughs> I love her work. I had recently gotten her book on the tarot. She did a whole thing on tarot cards. And I had also seen a wonderful show that was at LACMA here in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County Museum of Art on women surrealists. So um, yeah, I got a whole sort of shelf of, of the women surrealists. <laughs> And your titles for the works too, they tell so much of the story. Your titles are so literary and so imaginative and certainly, you know, looking at a work, I might in, just visually, I might interpret it one way on first sight and your title offers so much possible backstory. Um, can you talk a little bit more about your process for choosing a title or how that directs the yes, making of uh -huh. the work? Yeah, it's a real important process for me, a real, real important part of the of the piece. And they usually always come afterwards, you know, except for with this um, Black Garden. I knew I was taking, that's his poem, <laughs> Antonin Artaud. But for the conjurers, they each needed their own story. So there were these long, strange stories that I really, really worked on. Um, I mean, I'm not a writer. I love to read and, you know, um, so I wasn't taking the writing too seriously. There had to be a bit of element of, of silliness and strangeness and, um, you know, but I wanted that, that was a big important part of this whole notion of, of conjuring and the story behind like each thing that you're looking at, like what their abilities were, what their little history was, the weird things that they had done. Uh, they go in and out of these different realms. And uh, I worked a lot on the titles for that one. <laughs> Definitely. Whereas the Mad Woman in the Attic, I started with one one photo of that. A lot of, they all were of um, women from uh, 19th century novels, these crazy, these insane, sorry, uh, female heroines. So they had pretty simple titles like Teres Raquin or, um, you know, or I would name the book like um, <clears throat> The Yellow Wallpaper, that kind of thing. Because The Yellow Wallpaper, the heroine has no name. <laughs> But a whole literary, uh, there's a lot of literary, I didn't maybe talk about that much. Um, a lot of literary uh, influence, the whole notion of doing these altered books. Um, one of my early shows with altered books was called The Athenaeum. Um, so that's been something that's been running through like all of my work for the last 30 years. This is interest in literature. Thank you. And then maybe let's see, I have one last audience member question um, asking just to talk more about the use of the banner format. Are you referencing something specific? And if so, can you talk to that? Yes, when I first started doing the banners, it was part of uh, my show, Mulatto Nation, um, where I thought, okay, like this whole kind of uh, cliche about, oh, the mixed race person who's between two worlds and not in any world, that kind of thing. And so, okay, you this whole nomenclature of two worlds. So, okay, well, let's give this world in between a name, a geographical setting or nation. So I came with this idea of mulatto nation. And let's say if you're in some country, like you're in Iceland, they have their little national historic museums, you know? So what would it be like, like if you're, if you went to the mulatto nation museum? <laughs> So they always have portraits of the founding mothers and fathers in these museums, you know, so I thought, well, I'll do these large banners of um, the founding mothers and fathers of the Mulatto Nation. So I did one of Elizabeth Keckley, who was mixed, and she was a seamstress for, um, for Abe Lincoln's wife, Mary Lincoln, and I think she worked for her, and then she obtained her freedom or something like that. So I would do um, portraits of actual people from history and then just sort of make up make up ones too so that's how the idea of the banner started and then um i just like the idea of it being sort of non-traditional at least it wasn't that traditional 30 years ago maybe more people are working at doing hanging things as opposed to stretched canvases or working on board i like the the flowingness of it i like how you could hang it from the wall and um just as feeling different than a, a paint a rigid painting so, um, and it was also a way to incorporate uh, found objects and all these different layers. I like working in layers. I think like if physically you're presenting a bunch of layers with uh, fabric and, and lace and hair and tassels and paint, you're already saying, I'm showing you like a complex, a complex. I'm getting people ready to look at something that's maybe approached in a complex way and asking questions instead of it being um, like one note or one thing. And because all this stuff is complicated, you know, race is complicated, gender is complicated, uh, 
emotions are complicated, all the sort of different things that are interested to, interesting to me are not uh, monolithic. So just by the physicality of the, the medium, you're already getting a bit of a head start of, of, use of layers, this notion of layers. So uh, banner was a good way to work large. I before had done large things on, um, on board, but I would nail stuff to the boards like album covers or um, book covers or different fabrics and then paint on top of that. Um, but yeah, they were just very heavy and rigid. I like the lightness and fluidity of the banner and um, just how you can actually set up more of a scene using them. And, and like that one photo that I had of the banner with the two conjurers uh, on either side. It's almost like it's a theatrical backdrop to have it on a banner. And then whatever you put near it, you're like kind of creating a story, but with all of the different artworks bouncing off of each other. So it's sort of like a circus illustration backdrop or a, a theatrical painted, it's, it kind of gives me that idea too for how I combine all of the other works in the show to give it um, a bit of a theatrical presentation. Oh, I'm curious, is there something, um, an object or something from the Victorian era that you haven't yet found sort of in your materials gathering um, or, you know, in visiting oh. swap meets or is there something you have your eye, you know, eyes out for if you ever come across something that you're hoping to incorporate in a work yeah. someday or you're interested in? Wow, wouldn't it be great to find like a big old spinning wheel or something <laughs> or even a tiny one? I'd love to see what you did with that. If you, yeah, <laughs> if you ended up those spinning are wheel. too common. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting, like sometimes I'll go online and try to find something. It, usually it's sort of like, I like having the restrictions because it sort of pushes you to think in a different way. So I'll often just work with what I've got. I'll look through what I've got, what I found. I'm at a swap meet or flea market. I'm like, oh, that's cool, this hourglass or this. Like right now, this conjurer I'm making, there are a bunch of old spoons, you know, I kind of got the idea of sewing a bunch of spoons onto this uh, skirt. Um, and that's just kind of how I work. It's almost a collage sort of approach to, to everything. Like I do collages, but even the painting, it's a lot of like um, printing things out and moving them around. And uh, as opposed to, to sketching and being really stuck on my idea that's in my head, I like seeing it. So just sort of seeing the objects and working within the restriction of what I've got. And like, oh, I need a hammer. I'm gonna go online till I find an old hammer. Um, you know, I think it can kind of stretch you. It can stretch your imagination and your uh, pure creative process and take you somewhere you wouldn't ordinarily go having restrictions. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. Well, I think we've um, we've gone through all of our questions and I know you've got a okay. full day tomorrow too because I, you're meeting with students virtually. And um, mm -hmm. so we really appreciate you working with us to connect this way. And I hope that in the future, conditions will be right for you to pay a visit in person to see us. Oh, definitely. I'd love to come up there. It'd be great. <laughs> this has been such an excellent talk. And so unless you have any final words you want to share, I think we're at the end of our program. No, just thank you very much. Looking forward to, to meeting the students tomorrow. Great. Thanks so much. And thank you everyone for being here with us. Have a great night.